I'll get started. Um, I'm Diogo. Uh, I work at Google Brain, uh, but that's all I can tell you. Uh, my normal rule is if I told you, I'd have to kill you, but there's a whole lot of you guys, which makes that kind of impractical right now. Uh, standard disclaimer, everything I say reflects my own opinions. It's not representative of my employer. I have not been at Google long enough to know any secrets, though I will admit that I've pilfered some publicly available slides. So if there is a Google bias, it's not because they made me do it, it's because I'm lazy. Um, as far as some background for myself, um, I broke a 13-year losing streak for the Philippines in the International Math Olympiad. I got the top prize in the world in the interdisciplinary competition in modeling. And if you're familiar with Kaggle competitions, I also won one of those. So um, I like to compete and do all of these kinds of things. And uh, hopefully that convinces you that I know what I'm talking about. But uh, let's get started. The presentation is deep learning. What is it and what can it do for you? But I think the very first question is, why should I care? And that reminds me of a story. A machine learning researcher, a cryptocurrency expert, and an Erlang programmer walk into a bar. Facebook buys the bar for $27 billion. Um, and also another disclaimer, you may not know this, but I am both a machine learning researcher and from San Francisco. That means all of my information comes from Twitter. Uh, that's not a joke, so prepare for that for my slides. Um, but back to why you should care, machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, they're all guess getting a lot of press these days. They're all doing lots of stuff, and there's lots of hype, lots of news articles about all sorts of things, and everyone seems to want to get into it, but people don't really know what they're talking about. It seems that the only thing everyone's really sure of is that artificial intelligence, and it seems like very recently in particular, deep learning will be a catalyst for a lot of change that's happening. And people are asking me questions all the time about, this kind of thing, and some of these recurring themes are how will the world change, what can AI, and in particular deep learning do, and how do I take advantage of these trends? Uh, even the legendary programmer Jeff Dean has said, if you're not considering how to use deep neural nets to solve your problems, you almost certainly should be. It almost sounds like a threat. Um, either way, I hope you're motivated to learn. Um, that's all I have for motivation. So let's get started into what is deep learning? And it's quite easy. This is deep learning. Um, if you could memorize this diagram, this will make the presentation a lot easier. But th that's basically it. Um, just kidding. This is neither complete. There's a lot more to it than that. And it's also pretty complicated. We're going to start with something much more simple, namely calculus. Um, may not sound right. Even chapter one of the book, Calculus Made Easy, is titled to deliver you from the pre preliminary terrors. But we only need a little bit of calculus. And in particular, we need um, an algorithm called gradient descent. Uh, the derivative, uh, uh, one thing that calculus tells you is how to take derivatives. And a derivative, uh, loosely speaking, is it tells you how a function's output changes when you change its input. And gradient descent is just moving along the direction of the derivative in order to minimize a function that you can take the derivative of. So the insight into all of machine learning, uh, all of a lot of the recent machine learning is figure out how to frame your problem in such a way that what you care about is differentiable, or a proxy of what you care about is differentiable, and then minimize it. And this like one extremely simple equation summarizes almost all of the recent work in machine learning that's happened in the last uh, half decade, roughly. There's obviously exceptions to this rule, but majority of what's done either has been done with this exceptionally simple thing or can be done with this exceptionally simple, simple thing. And that's basically it as far as what deep learning really is in its essence. Uh, this might sound well and good, but this is just machine learning. When's it become deep learning? Uh, also easy, it's when you make it really deep. <laughs> it might sound like a joke, but actually what happens when you have these, you have these Machine learning used to be composed of these very, very simple functions because this is all we knew how to optimize. And what happens when you stack multiple of these simple functions together, you get something that's much, much more powerful. It, we don't really know how much more powerful it is. Some might claim it's exponentially more powerful. Um, but either way, we know it's much more powerful. 
And simply stacking these things and using the simple algorithm is what's caused the deep learning revolution to hit. And it's just using the same old simple algorithm, even though uh, as a caveat to that, we part of the hard part of deep learning is knowing that the simple algorithm will work for these very complicated models that have like stacks of layers and making problems non-convex. Is that it for deep learning? Uh, yes, this is it, roughly. Um, I'm skipping all sorts of details that I'm sure will be covered later, uh, from software that makes things easier to write, like TensorFlow or PyTorch, to hardware that makes things faster to run, like GPUs or multi-core CPUs or TPUs, to commonly used sub functions or layers that people have done lots of trial and error and just found to work well for some of today's problems without very good justification, uh, and also commonly used combinations of these layers or architectures that similarly people have used trial and error and found to work without very good justification. But for the purpose of that talk, the simpler algorithm is it. Next big question is, what can it do for you? Um, this may, the, there was a recent paper that came out that makes it a little bit easier to answer, because this article came, came out that surveyed a, I assume, lot of machine learning researchers. All of these little lines are people. So, uh, and there is a survey on the future progress on AI. So what do you think will happen? When will it happen? And there's a lot of really interesting things here that are amusing and possibly informative, maybe mostly amusing. Um, and let's break it down. On the easy end, you see Angry Birds at roughly the same difficulty as the World Series of Poker. Um, that's very unusual to me. I thought Angry Birds was solved. I'm pretty sure Angry Birds is solved. And the World Series of Poker is actually sounds really hard, but it's, it's down there near the easy end. Um, on the difficult end, I find it really interesting that AI researchers think it's, it's like the second top there, AI researcher, is significantly harder than math researcher. It seems like a 50-year gap between math research being solved and AI research being solved. Not saying that I agree or disagree, it's just interesting to point out. It actually looks like the gap between AI researcher and math researcher is larger than the gap between math researcher and playing Angry Birds at a human level. Um, so, I, I, I don't know if this reflects something about the field. Maybe that's why there's no good deep learning theory right now. Um, but who knows what's going on. But uh, importantly for knowing what deep learning can do for us is there's a lot of differing opinions on what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. There's some people who think that we will be getting general AI in roughly uh, 10, 15 years, and there's people who think it's over 100 years away. Um, I'm definitely in the latter camp, uh, to clarify. Um, but this makes it seem like answering the question, what can AI do for you correctly, be really hard, because there's just so many different opinions. How do you really know what the correct answer is? Uh, it's a tough problem, but luckily I'm the only one on stage, so I can just say whatever I want, and uh, no one can disagree with me. I guess you can disagree with me in the Q&A, and it'll be a good debate. Um, but um, I'm going to say what I think on this, and take it with a grain of salt. It doesn't reflect me. Uh, it doesn't, does reflect me. It doesn't reflect Google. It doesn't reflect anything else. Um, I do like to stand on the shoulders of giants, though, and I think there's been some people who have said things that resonated a lot with me, and like really, like when they say things really precisely, I feel like that helps refine my thinking on the problem. Um, this is one that I don't know if I agree with, but it's a really strong statement, and it seems like it could be a pretty good heuristic. This is by Andrew Ng, who is no longer the chief scientist at Baidu, but he says, if a, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. Uh, I, I can't think of that many counter-arguments that don't require like, a lot of like, very specific domain knowledge. Like Maybe people who play games a lot can play those games really fast because they've practiced it well, but roughly it seems like a pretty good heuristic, and it's a very like, strong statement. Um, so maybe this is something that could guide you answering that question. Um, another thing that isn't as specific, but I think is very important to consider is that uh, a lot of the, the deep learning successes today have been, um, I, I, I'm hesitant to use the word simple, but I, I feel like they're more simple memorization problems um, and not really thinking problems. It's always hard to really 
say what does thinking really mean, because that might be a moving goalpost of like, of course this algorithm is thi not thinking, it's using an A-star algorithm or something, while we might think that's kind of like thinking. But even in this case, it seems like when, it re when a task requires multiple steps of reasoning, where you can't like, use heuristics to jump all the way from input to output, it seems the deep learning has not been very good at that, especially not with a lot, a lot of help. Which leads me to uh, my general rule, which is deep learning is an appropriate tool for supervised direct pattern matching tasks, uh, bonus points if you can design priors that are particularly suited to your problem. The, the priors in this case are specific layers that are popular for certain tasks, but we don't have to get into that right now, um, even though feel free to ask me in the Q&A. But here when I say supervised, I mean that we tell the model directly what the correct answer is. So roughly uh, a human or some other process figures out what the right answer is via some means and tells the model, this is what you should be outputting next time. Um, there, are, uh, there have been incredible successes using reinforcement learning, which is not supervised, um, especially in the game playing domain. So if you've seen DeepMind's uh, DeepQ networks playing Atari or DeepMind's AlphaGo playing Go, those use um, a lot of reinforcement learning. And it, there definitely have been some successes. But how I feel about reinforcement learning is that it can work, but you don't want to rely on it working. And in the Bay, everyone ha has a startup on everything. And there's been a lot of people who kind of have bet their companies on, this is a reinforcement learning problem. Let us sell people on using deep reinforcement learning to get this working and ending up with uh, vaporware. Um, and kind of a sad end to that supervised part. But uh, as far as direct pattern matching goes, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, where you want simple relationships between the input and the output. Almost, almost like that a fraction of the input directly maps to some fraction of the output in some sort of additive-ish way. It doesn't have to be completely additive, but usually having some easy mapping allows you to bootstrap the more complicated mappings. And a lot of the more complicated mappings turn out to be so, like lots of little simple mappings composed together. And uh, this kind of thing seems to be how deep learning tel tends to work. This is all very vague, but I, I'm about to talk about some specifics about where deep learning has succeeded and where it seems to have not succeeded yet. Um, another disclaimer, this is only a subset of the potential cool things to talk about. Uh, and I'm only talking about the intersection of things I find interesting, because I want the slides to be interesting. There's lots of like little things that are cool, but maybe wouldn't be that interesting to people, and visual, and things that I know how to put in a presentation. So I, I have some attempts at videos, but they're optional. But I, there's some cool, lots of cool work in audio, but I just have no idea how to put that in a presentation. And um, yeah, maybe that's my bad. But we can solve Go and build robots, but technology isn't there yet for reliable audio and video. <laughs> this is also what happens when I make the graphics myself. So all of the, the pretty animated graphics have been stolen from other Googlers who know how to do art. Back on topic. Let's start with the easiest thing. Whenever you have a metric that when that metric goes up, money goes up, you probably want to use machine learning. Um, possibly deep learning, but definitely machine learning. This is actually, I would describe the main use case of machine learning. I have knobs to turn. Some combinations of these knobs are better than others. How do I turn them? Uh, basic stuff, but worth saying. Um, a big uh, thing that people get caught on is unsupervised learning. It's a very interesting research problem, but if you want to do anything practical, I would probably advise you to not do that. I think this is actually absolutely excellent advice, rather than trying to, if you can spend a month figuring out unsupervised learning, please do it. That, that, that will solve a lot of people a lot of time. Um, if you could spend a year, that would probably save a lot of people a lot of time. If you could do 10 years, you're probably on track with the rest of the field. Um, so. If you have a problem that you care about, don't try to do some magic where you don't know if it's going to work. Label some data. Usually these things are a lot more data efficient than people say they are. Um, and sticking to supervised learning will be much easier for your sanity as well as your uh, eventual impact. Speech recognition uh, has done really well, really, really well. People think that this is probably going to be one of the biggest changes to interfaces 
in not just our lifetimes, but in the next decade. Right now, people don't like to talk in phones because they, they, it kind of sucks. But people can talk much faster than they can type, and a lot of people don't know how to type very well. So this could completely change the way people interact with electronics. Things like Google Glass, or um, I hear it's really big in China, speech recognition. There's all sorts of things that this could enable. And this is only a fraction of the cool things happening in audio. But uh, I, I'm not going to talk about them much, but there's things with generating, uh, generating audio, generating music, lots of cool stuff there. Uh, translation. This animation is really cool, and this problem is really cool. Uh, this is showing that not only can deep networks improve on like, the traditional statistical methods that things like Google Translate used to do, but uh, where you just have matching corpuses, or corpi, I don't know what the plural is. Um, but you can also translate between language pairs that you've never, you don't even have matching corpuses on. So in this example, you have English to Japanese pairs, as well as Japanese to, sorry, English to Japanese and English to Korean. And using these networks, you can actually translate directly between Korean and Japanese without ever seeing paired data between Korean and Japanese, which is actually huge. It could enable a lot of translation on languages that, between languages that there's just no data on. And you can do it in a much more accurate way because you don't need to translate into an intermediate language where you lose some information. If you ever like, do um, Google, tr like uh, what, what's the game where you have like, a Markov chain with Google Translate, you start with a thing, you translate to one language, you translate back, eventually it becomes garbage and nothing like the original thing you said. And you just avoid that problem entirely with this. Image classification, this is like the bread and butter of deep learning. It's what made deep learning a big deal. Uh, people, it was kind of a not mainstream thing until about 2012 when deep learning won this ImageNet competition uh, and beat all of the other things by a fairly large margin and made everyone realize, hey, this solves problems that nothing else could solve before. Uh, and there's real world applications to this, like uh, Google Photos is an example. There's a lot of APIs where people um, have made a business of telling you what's in an image. People do face classification, face um, detection. Um, there's a lot of money in sentiment recognition. You know, like, have a camera here, look at the room, tell them if they're enjoying the talk or not, based on, like, people's smiles and stuff. Uh, maybe not for talks, but, like, for ads and stuff. Uh, something that can't be done yet, though, is unbiased image classification. Or it's still a lot of work. This was a, a huge issue for Google Photos. Actually, like, I think it was like a few days after they released it, uh, people were complaining on Twitter that um, their um, friends were being classified as gorillas um, due to a lack of diversity in the training data. And this is kind of unavoidable when you have imperfect data sets. Uh, I actually don't know how they solved this. They might have just removed some of the classes that could be mistaken as offensive. But uh, th that's just a hack, right? Like, we want like, real algorithms that don't make these kinds of stupid mistakes. Uh, talking about not making stupid mistakes, uh, a problem near and dear to my heart is medical imaging. Uh, there have been a l bunch of huge successes on medical imaging. In particular, there's been some really cool stuff done reading x-rays and CT scans. Cool stuff with segmenting pathology scans, um, detecting diabetic retinopathy. Uh, all of these things, it's, people have been getting superhuman results, like better than what seems to be the best doctors. And hopefully very soon, this kind of stuff will be like, reaching the end users and helping people. So this is a really exciting area uh, of deep learning's progress. Similar in that vein, um, it's not limited to either 2D images or having a single prediction per image. You can do what's called semantic segmentation, where you label each pixel, or in this case, voxel in an image. And you can also, it also works for higher dimensional data. So this, for example, is 3D segmentation of, I believe, a neuron. And th this algorithm actually is iterative in how it like, expands over time. And this is very similar to how a human would segment a neuron. It would not just say all at once, here's a neuron. It would start at something and being like, okay, this is close to this other thing. This is maybe a neuron. So we are, a as we're like expanding the reach of deep learning more, people are designing more and more of these priors to build into the architectures to do much smarter things. 
So whenever I say not yet on something, it might be that technology is there, but we just haven't tried hard enough. Um, talking about a not yet, uh, there's been some really cool work on image captioning. So instead of given an image, output a object in the image, it's given an image, describe the image. And this is a much harder task because there's a lot of things that can go on in an image, and there's a lot of possible ways to describe an image. How do you say something is right, and um, what, what set of things do you choose to have something describe? And this is pretty good. Like, these uh, descriptions are, actually, this is uh, a good case. There's many bad cases of this. But they still do make some really dumb mistakes. It might reflect underlying issues with our imaging models, or it might be due to data set size. But this is still an open research problem. Similarly to that, um, it's not very good at answering questions about images or stories. Um, it can be good at finding specific things in the images, but there's other things that seem to be easier than finding a thing, or just as easy as finding a thing that deep learning currently is not good at, like counting. If you ask, uh, this is, I don't have a counting example here, but if you have like a, a bowl of oranges, and you ask like how many oranges are in this bowl, this sounds like a very easy task, but um, it's quite hard for models right now. Um, so that's a big problem. Talking about big problems, we definitely are nowhere close to automating research. Um, this is a great tweet. Um, we, we, the researchers were the ones that wanted to make the AI do all the work and play games, and while well, they play games, but instead it's the opposite, right? The AI is just playing games all day, and researchers are working harder than ever. Uh, it's a tough life. Uh, I think the comments in this were equally great, because maybe this is a sign that the AI is actually intelligent. You know, maybe it's like just pretending to be dumb and being like, why would I want to do all the work? I'm just going to keep playing games all day. Some aspects of research might be automated. Um, something that some people consider to be either boring or a waste of time or hard is designing these architectures in the first place. And there has been some work in using deep learning to automate the, architect the design of architectures for more deep learning. And you get like these crazy things that no one would ever design. Um, yeah, I would definitely not to think to do that uh, in the right. So um, this stuff has had some fairly promising results. Uh, I, I, I put this under a maybe of what can be plausible, because it's both, it was both very expensive and not quite as good as a state of the art. But this seems like a really promising avenue and a potential place that it could make a big impact. So maybe all of our learning about architecture and studying this in trial and error, maybe all of this will be outsourced to uh, you know, farms of computers somewhere, and we could just you know, stick to the high-level tasks. But life is rarely that kind. Um, a, despite fake news to the contrary, we are a long ways away from automating software development. There were some articles on algorithms automating coding, and um, I, I think that some people were a little bit panicked on this. Maybe all of the articles when deep learning automates X causes some panic, but I hang around, I hang out with lots of software engineers, so. They were worried for like a second until they realized that this thing was actually really, really dumb. Um, not that the, the work was dumb, but how the algorithm did it was nowhere close to software engineering. It was a slightly better heuristic for picking random bits of code together and doing trial and error on that code. And as we all know, that is absolutely not how we do software engineering, right? Like we design stuff up front, not trial and error. It's like all done by the books. Um, yeah, this algorithm definitely can't do that. <laughs> so we're, our jobs are safe, right, guys? Okay, um, so some, peop some people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, there's some great memes. Uh, this is not really model output, but if you do follow the field, um, people love to have fun things in there. Some people actually wrote a confefe paper. Um, I, I think that's pretty incredible that someone can like dedicate a research paper with, I assume, a real idea. I didn't read this, um, but I assume it's a real idea to a troll name. I think it's great, and it shows like the speed of publishing in the field. Um, common Silicon Valley problem: No, 
deep learning will not solve all of your problems, especially not your product definition problems. It won't find something useful for you to do, and it will not make you magically rich, <laughs> despite a lot of belief to the contrary. And um, similar to this uh, image, uh, general chatbots are actually quite difficult. You'd think that you just give you know, a model a data set of two people talking, and it'll be able to replicate those people talking. But it turns out that our language models are quite good at making things that look grammatically correct, but are semantically quite terrible. So they don't have, like, they don't have any history involved. They don't have, they, there's lots of issues with them. And this, like, a misunderstanding to that led to a lot of companies starting products that ended up pivoting away from using deep learning at all and ended up using like an army of workers in the Philippines just manually doing the chatting for them, which turns out to be a pretty economical way to do things. <laughs> um, but specific chatbots are very doable. So when you, if you turn the problem from, hey, let's generate arbitrary text, to hey, let's pick among a small set of valid responses, uh, things become a lot easier. Um, this is uh, Inbox's smart reply, which apparently is used by over 10% of mobile Inbox replies, which sounds like a lot of qualifications. Um, but I just think it's cool that something started out as an April Fool's Day is now real. Uh, April Fool's Day joke. Um, it's also a sweet animation. But this kind of stuff is very plausible, and I think that people who do use machine learning for chatbots will end up constraining the problem quite a bit, and that's actually very doable. If you're trying to classify, like, do I have enough information, or is this person uh, satisfied, or do I need to pull another human in to actually chat with this person, that's much more doable than, hey, bot, automatically solve this person's IT issues, which sounds really hard. And similar in vain to that, uh, coherent text is quite a challenge, like long, any long amount of text. A lot of journalists, journalists I feel like are a, a big victim to hype because it's kind of their fault. Um, and they're kind of worried about their jobs, about are, de are deep nets gonna like, start writing articles for us? And the answer seems to be no. So if you're a journalist, don't worry. Oh, sorry? Uh, did you say it's hard to investigate journalists as an AI? I, I couldn't quite hear the last part of that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, he said, as an AI, it's hard to do investigative journalism. That is definitely true. Um, debatable about how much investigative journalism current journalists do. Um, but uh, th th that's definitely the case. Um, I think in this case, it is um, even the worry that a lot of journalism is you know, read stuff on Twitter, turn it into an article, um, hope to get lots of clicks, make clickbaity headline topic. Um, uh, definitely not all of it, but some fraction of it is that. And I think that there is some worry about this. Like, I believe in finance, there's a, a big race to, like, who can publish these articles first uh, based on various data sources. And um, if you're not talking about quality but speed, um, these things definitely have a speed advantage. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm personally not worried about journalists' jobs being taken. Um, <laughs> For sure. Um, cool. Sorry. Um, sorry I couldn't hear you very well, but thank you for uh, yelling that time. Um, uh, the, yeah. So uh, something that seems to be really promising, I actually think that this is one of the most promising uh, upcoming uses of deep learning that's like not quite there, but might be there, and it's like a, would be a really sexy field to get into, is robotics. It seems like there's a lot of really good stuff happening with imitation learning, and a lot of people are invested. Is this working? Oh, it is working. This is pretty cool. Um, uh, people are investing in, a lot of the, the, the research labs are investing in getting 
um, uh, the uh, robots training together and like how do we collect lots of data for robots to get them working automatically because right now uh, at least to my understanding I'm no roboticist is that majority of the work done by robots is done manually and if we can like make it a lot easier to train robots to do things that we care about maybe all of a sudden we're going to have like more general programmable robots that people can do stuff with so uh, that I think is really really promising um, and at least from a, a research perspective, someone who reads the papers and like keeps up with what people are doing, it seems very plausible that um, this kind of thing could make a breakthrough in the near term, especially with what's called imitation learning, where robots, rather than learning by trial and error, which can be very hard, they just learn to copy humans, which is goes back into the, the rule of thumb I was talking about, where um, giving giving these algorithms supervised data, telling them what to do, generally works a lot better than uh, hoping for magic that, you know, hoping that they will magically figure out the, th the thing to do, which is what a, a lot of the field is trying to get working right now. Uh, depending on who you ask, uh, game playing, I, I, would I would categorize that as not yet there. There have been some amazing successes in game playing, but um, it, a lot of those successes aren't quite super general. A lot of it is like very input, simple input-output mapping, like I was mentioning. So Atari seemed to be a lot of that. Um, debatable whether or not Go was that, even though that was definitely a huge win. But there's been other games where models are nowhere as near as successful. So things like, even like very simple Minecraft mazes, um, it's still, the models still aren't quite there yet. Or um, recently there's been a bunch of work on Doom. Uh, visual Doom, like Doom from the Pixels, and um, this model actually is super cool. Let me see here, does this work? I can skip to the, the fighting. So there's been a lot of progress on that really recently. Um, so this is like uh, the, what was state of the art in 2013. If you can tell, it's like pretty dumb. It's like shooting a wall right now. Um, let's see here. Yeah, this is, so this is a little bit smarter. This was state of the art in, um, I would say, 2016-ish, uh, mid-2016. This is still pretty dumb. Um, and uh, people have been making a lot more progress recently uh, with this, where, look at this, this is actually intimidating. Um, it's like moving around, it's shooting intelligently, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there, there's been a lot more progress being made in this, and it seems that uh, we're nowhere near close to, uh, or at least to my knowledge, solving something like StarCraft. But um, it's really promising, and people are putting a lot of effort into this. So the likelihood that we make some big breakthroughs in the coming years seems to be likely. Um, cool. And um, this is category of stuff. It's like what I am one of the most excited about, just because I would never consider using like these extremely powerful classification models for artsy things. Maybe that's just me. Um, but some of these use cases are incredibly creative and incredibly cool. And like this stuff is amazing. This one came out pretty recently. And it learns to transform images from different domains. So transforming like a zebra into a horse or vice versa. So image transformation, um, it can be done. Uh, can even be done with videos. So this is like actually really done by a model. It's not like cherry pick data. Let's see. So it's actually like transformed this video. And like, this is not seamless, but that's pretty good. Um, better than I could do with Photoshop, which is not saying much. But like, this is like pretty impressive. And I would not even have thought of this as a use case. Like, hey, I'm a machine learning researcher at Google. Um, I have a you know giant cluster. I'm gonna transform a horse into a zebra, right? Um, uh, unfortunately, this kind of thing is not completely reliable, <laughs> um, but this is pretty amusing. Um, so, like with all machine learning, like making it completely reliable can be challenging. Uh, talking about that, there's been an app that's uh, been gaining popularity called Face App that does facial transformation. So in the top left, you see the original photo. Top right, you see like a uh, more manly transformation, you know, like more edgy chin, 
Bill Beardy. Then bottom left, an oldness transformation. And bottom right, a smiling transformation. And this is actually pretty good. Pretty good, and like an app can do it on your phone. No human input. It just does it. Um, it's pretty impressive that it can do this. And this is a really cool use case. Unfortunately, it's not perfect. In particular, um, it also suffers from that bias problem. Like with many other things, when you turn a cool model into a product, it, there's a different set of requirements. In this case, they had a transformation which makes a person's face hotter. And one of the things it did was it always lightened the skin, which was offensive to some people. Um, yeah, that, they had to pull that feature, I think. Or I, I think they actually changed the name from hot to something else. Uh, I can't remember. Um, art is doable. This is art from scratch, or unconditional art. Like, it's like these models can just create these artsy things. And I think that this is really, really cool. Um, I personally think that these both look really good. Um, can I get a show of hands of who thinks the one on the left is better? What about the right? Oh, it looks like a tie. I made the one in the left. Um, so I was hoping that people would vote for that one. Um, cool. I, I think they're both really cool. I would definitely have a poster of that in my room or a painting of that in my house. Um, then this kind of thing, like, who would have even thought that as a side effect of these really powerful, um, actually useful things, we would get art? Oh yeah, I'm definitely not claiming that this is the, like the, the 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 first thing in terms of algorithmic art. It's just um, I, I find to just be a really cool use case of deep learning because when I I don't think 10 years ago people would have imagined like yeah imagine all of these cool pictures we'll make um, and every actually every time there's a new use case in art I'm just amazed like who thought of this like who spent their time on this. And I'm thankful for that, because I, I wouldn't have done it, but I think it's really awesome. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, it's, it's also kind of cool that uh, unlike fractals or something like that, it feels like there's, there's a lot more, like there's more unknown unknowns in this right now, which makes it really promising as well. Um, maybe that's from my misunderstanding of art, though, or algorithms, <laughs> or anything. Uh, I'm not expert in any of this stuff. Um, sketching was a, another recent use case where you was trained in a data set of humans drawing little things, and the things in the, the top corner up there is things that the model drew, and in the bottom here, you could actually do math on sketches. So you take like a cat face, you add in a pig with a body, you subtract a pig face, and you end up with like a cat with a body. And like, that's kind of cool that it works. Um, it, it, I mean, the math checks out, um, so <laughs> uh, awesome. Um, for, for the non-artists in the room, it can also turn what is arguably not art in the bottom left into something that is potentially art. So this is another very cool use case where um, you, like, it can like, enable people to it becomes almost like um, you know, a new artistic medium, right? Where you can now use these things to enhance ex existing art to do things maybe that people wouldn't have done before, or enable people who couldn't have done this before, or maybe just make it more faster, or something like that. It feels almost like, um, you know, like a new instrument from the musical sense. So this stuff is really cool. Um, style transfer, I think this is crazy because a year and a half ago, this was already looking really good, and it's just gotten better and better. So this is like going so well. I, I uh, actually I should have put the old pictures here as well, but like these are the new, the 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 what I think is the latest in style transfer, and this is pretty good. Like you can see transferring the style of a fire into a bottle. Like this is like a professional Photoshop job, and I guess. Um, and 
this is like impressive, and I would want to do this, and um, I, I look forward to this being able to be done for me because I don't want to implement it myself. Um, but th there's a lot of really cool stuff being done with style transfer, and uh, th this stuff is really pragmatic because, uh, like, aesthetically, this is already like very high quality. Um, uh, this is my crowning achievement, actually, mixing uh, my face with that of a Pokemon. Um, probably my best achievement in deep learning. Um, definitely works. Would recommend trying it again, and probably newer stuff will work even better. And uh, as far as specific go to go, there's all sorts of other things. Uh, a rough formula is pick an input that is similar to another input that deep learning has succeeded on, like images, audio, uh, raw text, um, other domains like that. Pick a response that is a relatively simple mapping uh, from that input. So nothing too complicated, um, but simple mappings like are they human faces. And collect a data set, train a model. Um, usually something like that gets to something that works quite well. And um, as far as what it can do, um, if you if you pick the right things, it, it generally it generally uh, makes it, it, it the, the algorithms help you a lot in doing uh, a lot of the easy work for you. Getting like the last bit of percent is always a lot of work, but um, you, you'll you'll know if you can get it, which it, which makes it a little bit easier. Oh, um, so back to the big questions: um, How will the world change? Um, I think this is a great tweet. Like Andrew Ng, I do believe automation and steroids is the right way to think about it, not sentience or AI overlords or anything else like that. Um, I actually would be quite pleasantly surprised to see general AI in my lifetime, um, just because I think that's so unlikely. A and that's not because, despite what my current pants might imply, that I'm one of the live fast, die young types. Um, it's, it's that I, I think that it's quite, quite a ways away, um, though I would love to be wrong. Um, as far as how will the world change, uh, I won't claim to be an expert on the societal effects of automation, uh, but luckily this guy would. He had a TED talk called, Will Automation Take Away All Our Jobs? All seems like a little bit of a weasel word here. It has over a million views. Uh, and uh, Betrich's law of headlines applies here. Any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered by no. Um, so the answer is no, <laughs> saving you 18 minutes. Uh, the claim is that AI automation, just like other automation, will take some jobs away, but it will probably do much more transformation of jobs because a lot of jobs aren't these just simple mappings and there's more complicated, nuanced things to them. Um, but automation increases the leverage of any person and there will be a lot more jobs that we just can't imagine will happen. So um, th that's his view. I, I don't have strong views on this. Um, yeah. <laughs> what can deep learning do? The field's really exciting. There's a whole lot of things that we can do now that we previously couldn't. A lot of things that were once thought to be really, really hard are now doable. Uh, people thought out solving Go was like 100 years away or more. and. Um, there's all sorts of fields that this could affect. Um, as far as specifics go, which is what would actually be more useful to you guys, um, the answer is it's kind of complicated. Um, my advice would be to look at example failure and success cases, network with researchers and people in industry, or use someone's rule of thumb, maybe my own, maybe take it and change it. But really, you want to build your own mental classifier of what is and isn't possible and refine that classifier around the set of problems that you specifically care about. So if you want like a specific, like I want to figure out if deep learning can find X in a genomic data set, you, you like go into the research, look in that, figure out like what seems possible, what's not. And uh, there's so many problems out there that you might, have, you might end up being the world expert in knowing if deep learning works for your problem. So it, it's just, there's so much opportunity right there that, um, if you ask anyone, they probably will tell you an answer because people love to give answers, but they probably won't give you a very good one, uh, including myself. So it, right now it's unavoidable to do some of that work unless you do something that someone's already solved, but that's kind of a, a cop-out answer. Um, the last big question it was, how do I take advantage of these trends? 
Um, I think it's a lot like learning software engineering, especially back in like when the internet was young. Um, and my answer is scratch your own itch. Play around with it. A lot of the work on art specifically was done by hobbyists and not researchers. And we have no idea yet what can be done on you know, the problems you care about. And for all you know, you might be sitting on Deep Learning's next killer app that no one else has thought of. And if scratching your own itch leads to something valuable to others, um, start a company on it. There's lo lots of money for companies going around ri right now, and the world needs more AI companies that actually provide value. Uh, I'm not going to name names. <laughs> um, and also, uh, prepare for like a sweet transition. Um, consider joining Google. It's the best. Uh, or any other like AI-focused company, which is like interesting, impactful problems and the resources to solve those problems. Thank you. <laughs>